Has anybody gotten dripped on since walking oh, forward? Yes. It's, co it's called a cave kiss. <laughs> So here are a couple of interesting formations juxtaposed. Here's a stalagmite growing upward. Here's a kind of stalactite growing downward. It's called a drapery is a general term, right? Because it looks like drapes hanging down. And they're about to come together. And when they meet right there and they connect, then that's called a column, a floor to ceiling uh, formation. Now, as I look at these things, um, I'm not too far away from breakfast. I see these white sort of fatty layers, and then I see the more meatier brownish layers. It looks to me like a kind of food that I can't, I can't seem to break the habit in my quest to be healthier and environmentally more responsible. And in fact, there's a restaurant in Austin I've yet to try. I've resisted, but it's actually, it's called Bacon is the name of the restaurant. Like every dish has it in there. So, um, Geologists and cave scientists are no different than uh, many other fields of study. We have to come up with a lingo. It's important to have this lingo, this set of terminology, this syntax to be able to communicate with other scientists in our field exactly what our observations are. And oftentimes that kind of terminology seems really kind of highfalutin and, uh, oh, you're just trying to be fancy to be exclusive to help get grant money and things like that. Uh, geology field is no different than that. There's a lot of very kind of highfalutin terms. And the name that's used in the literature for formations like this is cave bacon. <laughs> Watch your head here. All right, we're at this location called the uh, drapery column. It's because it's a uh, confluence of a stalactite that's uh, more specifically a drapery with a big stalagmite or a co combination composite stalagmite. They've grown together to make a column. I'd like to pose another query here about conduit versus diffuse flow by giving you a little bit of background on the drip rate. So this is a site we monitor regularly if you've read uh, some of the publications uh, sent around the links to. This location is uh, ISDC, Inner Space Caverns Drapery Column. And we measure the drip rate of this drop right here. Can you see the drop? It's just barely emerging there. And we could sit here and wait and wait and wait to see how long it would take for that thing to drip. Maybe it'll drip while, we, while we're standing here in the next several minutes. Maybe it won't drip till tomorrow. It's really slow right now. Uh, again, we're in the midst of this um, four-year drought. Uh, what I can tell you is when we've had good rainstorms on the surface and come down here the next day or a couple of days later, this thing is dripping so fast. The way we normally do this is we uh, hit our stopwatch and we let 60 seconds go by and we count how many drops fall. It's dripping so fast we can't do that. And so it's very responsive to something happening at the surface. So when there's nothing happening at the surface for a long time. We don't see much of a drip. Yet, we can show you other drip, drip sites in this cave that there could be a tropical storm come by and dump three inches, four inches in a 24-hour period right above the cave. And we'll come down here. This thing's just going nuts like I was talking about. And we go to this other site where no matter when we come and do that, it's easy with the stopwatch. We have to stopwatch and we count. There's about 45 drips per, per minute. You come back a month later, it's 48 drips per minute. You come back a month later, it's 44 drips per minute. A tropical storm goes by, we come by the next day, it's 45 drips per minute. No matter what you do, it's a real flat liner. So compare that side I just described with this one in terms of conduit and diffuse, right? The, the latter, the one that never changes, has that really steady pulse as a diffuse strip site. It tells us that there must be an enormous amount of water in, in the Vado storage zone above these sites, and it's very diffuse, whereas there's very little storage. Right? These things, they fill up and they drain really quickly. It rains, they fill up, they drip, and they, and they empty their bladder, so to speak. Okay, so that's, uh, this is a, a real classic kind of conduit site, and in terms of the rate and the response to the surface, and I can also add on that the, the geochemical evolution that I talked about earlier. 
shows this to be a more conduit site as well. So we can see the surface here of the Edwards limestone, and here's some speleothems, just like the ones we've been looking at, and here are some really odd-looking things here. Very odd-looking things. Originally, these were thought to be burrows, some large burrowing creature, but on closer inspection, it was found that they're bivalves, clams. Remember we talked on a previous trip about in the words of uh, Don Bebout of the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas, these are clams that went crazy, thought they were corals, and they started growing everywhere. And back in the Cretaceous, they had their heyday, and this kind of bivalve is called a rudis bivalve, R-U-D-I-S-T. And this rudis bivalve, instead of having these sort of equal shells like uh, most bivalves do, they actually had a really asymmetric structure. They had one long tubular valve and the other one was more like a lid on top of a trash can. And these things uh, attached themselves to the seafloor, grew upward. Uh, they, would, they would die at the end of their lives or there would be a storm that would topple them and then their brethren would start growing up on top of them. That little extra elevation got them higher up in the photic zone. It gave them a more firm substrate to build off of than a muddy, slippery substrate. And that ability to grow fast and withstand wave and current energy uh, gave them a competitive advantage. And they occupied this particular ecological niche called the shelf margin, right at the shelf slope break, where we have really good circulation, really good supply of nutrients. Today, that competitive that competitive advantage to occupy that ecological niche is enjoyed by corals, but back in the Cretaceous, rudis were having their heyday, and they went extinct, and uh, they're actually not found in the Cenozoic. They went extinct uh, by the end of the Mesozoic time period. So we're taking CO2 measurements. That's a good datum for you guys to record in your notes. 